We have the pleasure today to welcome Dr. James Kenneller, currently practicing at Cadillac Medical Center in Richland, Washington. He has instituted the area's first electrophysiology program, specializing in the treatment of atrial fibrillation. Uh, for those of you that aren't aware of what an electrophysiologist is, in layman's terms, it's another elevation and level of a typical cardiologist who can specialize in a variety of arrhythmia dysfunctions. Dr. Kanaller has a passion and he is dedicated to treating uh, patients with this uh, disease state in the most innovative ways possible. So with no further ado, I'd like to welcome Dr. James Kanaller. So thank you, Scott, and thank you, everybody, for coming out this morning. It's great to see such a fantastic uh, crowd here this morning. It is a beautiful day. It is the weekend, and it, it's um, reassuring to see there's such a tremendous interest in our community uh, regarding the topic of atrial fibrillation. It's certainly a topic that I am very passionate about. Our title this morning is Atrial Fibrillation for Patients and Families, All Your Options, Everything You Need to Know. I see hundreds of patients for atrial fibrillation. They come in all shapes and sizes, all ages. Our typical age range is 50 to 85. I perform ablation procedures for atrial fibrillation, medical management, try to find the best solution for each person. Our average age of patient that we take to catheter ablation is age 70. And um, there are numerous patients, several patients of mine that I recognize here today, some who are already on our schedule um, for ablation procedures. So we'll take, we'll take this topic one step at a time, walk through it very carefully. This is the level of our discussion in our audience, in my office, sorry, focusing on the questions that my patients find most relevant. We'll have plenty of time for questions and answers at the end, so I'll ask you to hold your questions and we'll take each of them in turn um, towards the end of our presentation. So just a few of my industry disclosures. A disclaimer, this presentation is for broad informational purposes. Specific choices of how for your health care should be made with a qualified health care professional. This is a broad informational talk. I presently see patients at the Cadillac Clinic in Richland, Washington, perform procedures at the Cadillac Regional Medical Center, also in Richland, Washington, including ablation for atrial fibrillation. And here is us um, pictured starting an ablation procedure for one of our patients. So what is atrial fibrillation? On the left, we see a heart in normal sinus rhythm. So a heart in normal rhythm. The electrical impulse, as we see, begins in the top chamber. These are the atria where atrial fibrillation can occur. The impulse propagates across that chamber and then activates the main pumping chambers of the heart so you get your heart beat, your heart contraction. Electrically, it looks like this. This little blip on your ECG is the atrial contraction, then the ventricular contraction, recovery. So atria, ventricle recovery, top, bottom, recovery. That's a normal heartbeat. During atrial fibrillation, we have very rapid, disorganized, chaotic electrical activity in those top chambers, seemingly coming from everywhere, and that activity will bombard the bottom main pumping chambers such that they activate in a very irregular fashion. So here we see now the activation of the main pumping chambers occurring rapidly, very irregularly, with no evidence of organized activity in the top chambers in between. That's a normal heart. That's a heart in atrial fibrillation. How do we diagnose atrial fibrillation? We do this with an electrocardiogram. And here's a picture of a gentleman who's having his electrocardiogram recorded in a doctor's office. There are leads that attach to the chest and to the arms as well as the legs. And we record 10 seconds of heart activity. And it's that visual picture of the irregularly irregular activa activation of your heart which gives us the diagnosis of atrial fibrillation. And again, between the activation of the main pumping chamber, we see no clearly organized rhythm occurring in the top chambers, which are in fact supporting the atrial fibrillation. If you have an ECG during atrial fibrillation, 
We label you as someone who is known for atrial fibrillation, and we are always suspicious that that rhythm may be present in you at any particular time um, going forward. So the next question is, do I have atrial fibrillation? You know, what symptoms would I experience if I had atrial fibrillation? And symptoms due to atrial fibrillation can range from completely non-existent to severe. We have patients, seemingly the same person for all practical purposes. One person is completely driven crazy by this thing, and the next person can hardly even tell that it's present. Um, classic is palpitations, so the feeling of a rapid fluttering or pounding heartbeat, or the sensation that you're simply out of rhythm, something isn't right. These are the words that patients come up with um, to describe how they feel. In fact, what is most common with atrial fibrillation is fatigue, and that fatigue parallels the duration of your episodes of atrial fibrillation. If you have short episodes that come and go, your fatigue will be sort of mild intermittent. If atrial fibrillation is always present, that fatigue tends to be always present and profound. And you can think if your heart is constantly racing, it's like running a marathon that never ends and it's exhausting. Even though you may not be exercising or moving, your heart is working harder than it would be normally, and that process, because the heart does consume a fair amount of energy for its activity, um, will be exhausting for you. With the feeling of fatigue is shortness of breath, of another very common symptom. And then, as I mentioned, no symptoms. Um, patients are asymptomatic. Some people simply can't tell that they have atrial fibrillation, and when you really ask them carefully, they're not even sure if they are more tired due to the arrhythmia. We tend to suspect that it's there. We tend to think there's a layer of fatigue superimposed on their lives if they are um, in atrial fibrillation. Still have to recognize that some people just don't seem to be bothered by it. So anything is really possible. And that's why each person has to be considered very individually in terms of what their experience is. So again, am I in atrial fibrillation? And here our cartoon man is asking, is that funny feeling in my chest my atrial fibrillation or something else? So we know that symptoms are unreliable in that 95% of atrial fibrillation episodes have been shown to be asymptomatic. You can't tell that it's happening. Suspicious symptoms that you might think are your atrial fibrillation are incorrectly attributed to atrial fibrillation 85% of the time. So when you do feel something funny, it may very well not be your arrhythmia. And then individuals known to have symptomatic episodes of atrial fibrillation may in fact have asymptomatic episodes 12 times more frequently. So we start to see the smoke and mirrors that this condition represents. You may have it, you don't know it, you may feel something funny that may be your atrial fibrillation, it may not be. Those folks who tend to overestimate their atrial fibrillation are individuals who are prone to anxiety, also depression. Those who tend to underestimate their atrial fibrillation have increased age and also female gender. And we have studies supporting um, these findings. It's about this time that I'm asked, what actually causes atrial fibrillation? And that's a very challenging question in point of fact. We know there are certainly risk factors hypertension, obesity, sleep apnea, being hypothyroid or excessive alcohol or drug intake can all change your heart, your atria, in a way that it is predisposed to fibrillate. Other conditions, inf inflammation conditions, oxidative stress, joint disease, inflammation throughout your body can antagonize the atria, predispose them to atrial fibrillation, which is our common endpoint. We know that atrial fibrillation tends to beget atrial fibrillation. So the more you have, the more prone you are to having more, which makes a strong case for early control of atrial fibrillation. In fact, um, I was fascinated by the mechanisms of atrial fibrillation very early on in my career, and during my medical training took time to do a PhD in the mechanisms of atrial fibrillation, trying to understand how in fact do these very complex rhythms in the top chamber of your heart actually support themselves. And that is a challenging question, and there's a variety of mechanisms. Uh, one of my research projects was studied, was published in this cardiac journal and featured on the front cover in 2001, and that's uh, my photo giving a talk uh, 
sort of similar to this one in 2002, um, just after defending my thesis. So I see each, each patient as a particular puzzle to be solved. You know, how are they maintaining this complex rhythm? Why is it occurring in this person? And what is the best option for this individual to control the arrhythmia and ultimately give each patient the highest quality of life and best chance of minimizing any potential complication um, due to arrhythmias. So we take each person very individually and very seriously. And atrial fibrillation is a huge problem and it's growing fast. Hence our interest this morning. We know that three million people in the United States have a diagnosis of atrial fibrillation right now and we're expecting that number to exceed 12 million by the year 2050. 5% of the population over age 65 has been diagnosed at age, with atrial fibrillation at some point. 10% of the population over age 75, such that atrial fibrillation is recognized to be our latest epidemic. It's like high blood pressure or diabetes. So many people have it, and the same is true for, for atrial fibrillation, and it's increasing. Again, our clinic populations typically range from age 50 to age 85, sort of the average age of people that we take for an ablation procedure, which I'll discuss, tends to be about 70, although there's um, lots of spread in that number as well. Makes you ask the question, should we be screening our population for asymptomatic atrial fibrillation? If so many people have this, should we just be checking everybody or should we wait for them to actually present and complain about this? This has actually been recently studied and published in 2014 by a very credible group in Australia and they've shown us that a single ECG or pulse check in your doctor's office would detect atrial fibrillation in 1.4% of the general population um, age 65, age and above. These people may be unaware of their atrial fibrillation. The risks due to atrial fibrillation are nevertheless every bit as present and every bit as important in those asymptomatic individuals. You can actually use your iPhone to screen for atrial fibrillation. Attach an Alive Core monitor to your atrial, to your iPhone and it can sense your heart impulse through your fingers, record what your heart is doing, and give you a diagnosis of atrial fibrillation if that's in fact what your rhythm is at the time that you are assessing. Won't continuously monitor you, but if you do do those spot checks, you may find it. And it's actually been studied as a screening tool in asymptomatic individuals and found to detect atrial fibrillation, like I said, about 1.4% of the time randomly in asymptomatic individuals age 65 and above. A lot of us don't have iPhones. A lot of us with iPhones, including myself, don't have the Alive Core monitor. It would give us a spotty assessment of our heart, what our heart rhythms are doing. Um, but may not be sufficient to give us the diagnosis because it's not a continuous monitoring tool. And atrial fibrillation does have very serious consequences. We know that there is a five-fold increased risk of stroke compared to the general population due to atrial fibrillation. That accounts for 36% of strokes in the age 80 to 89 category. And we know that strokes due to atrial fibrillation are more disabling they are more likely to recur, and they're more likely to be fatal than strokes due to other causes. There's a three-fold increased risk of heart failure due to atrial fibrillation, two-fold increased risk of myocardial infarction or a heart attack due to atrial fibrillation, and a two-fold increased risk of dementia or early mortality due to atrial fibrillation. So it is serious. Here we see a heart and the, the, um, the vasculature connecting the heart very intimately with your brain. If there is disorganized contraction in your atria, in your top chamber due to atrial fibrillation, the blood tends to pool, clots then form, and then your heart pumps that clotted blood to your body, including your brain, and that's the mechanism of stroke. So a little blood clot that formed here gets pumped to your brain, it causes a blockage, that area of your brain dies, there's your stroke due to atrial fibrillation. So we need to protect our patients who have atrial fibrillation very diligently for the possibility of stroke. 
So what about understanding your atrial fibrillation? And this brings us to the topic of monitoring. We've already touched on it, but continuous heart rhythm monitoring. If you come to our clinic and we're suspicious of atrial fibrillation or want to get a sense of how much you have, we'll often begin with an ambulatory monitor. You can wear this continuously as an outpatient, up to 30 days with a single prescription. It's um, three stickers to your chest and then you get a hip pack. And this will detect any atrial fibrillation that you have while you're wearing the monitor. You can also report symptoms to the monitor. So if you feel like you're having it, you press a button, it records whatever your heart's doing and reports it to us. And then we can tell you if the symptoms you're experiencing are due to atrial fibrillation or not. And here is what a typical report will be in my office. 30 days of monitoring for the diagnosis of atrial fibrillation. And we see that in this gentleman, about 3% of the time he was having atrial fibrillation. During atrial fibrillation, the average heart rate was 74, ranged up to as fast as 170 beats a minute. And when he did un feel unwell and press the button, sure enough, atrial fibrillation was present and that was explaining his symptoms. So a tremendous amount of information that we can get over a period as long as 30 days. And you say that's wonderful, but then what happens when my treatment changes and my atrial fibrillation changes? How do I know if I have been successful or not in reducing the atrial fibrillation? Do I have to repeat the 30-day monitor? And that's always uh, one solution. We can do a little bit better for you. There's another type of monitor that's just recently become available. It's this patch. It's like a thick band-aid that fits over your chest. You can wear that for 77 days at a time and it will also document all of your atrial fibrillation during that period. With one prescription, I can prescribe four in a row, so you get 28 days of continuous monitoring through this Band-Aid type application. So there's short-term monitoring tools that are becoming more available. Most recently, and we're having the anniversary of our, of our first implant in the Tri-Cities on March 24, is an implantable continuous cardiac monitor. And this is this link technology that's become available. Very small device the size of a paper clip. I can slip this under your skin right over your chest. It will sense every beat of your heart for the next three years, automatically add up all the atrial fibrillation you're having, tell us how much you're having, when your episodes start, how long they last, how fast your heart goes during atrial fibrillation, everything. And you can report your symptoms to the monitor. If you feel unwell, you have a garage door opener type device. You simply click over top of the monitor and it records whatever your heart's doing at that time, reports that information to us. So very powerful tool for keeping track of your atrial fibrillation and telling us how well we're doing as your therapy changes. And we watch the burden of atrial fibrillation decrease. We watch the rate slow down. We tell you if the treatment has been effective, if there are more things that we need to do. Um, helps, helps guide us um, at every step of your management. Here's a picture from our first implant in Washington State. It was done at the Catholic Hospital on March 24. Here's a small skin incision mark, and the dotted lines show where that loop recorder or the implantable monitor is sitting. And you can't even tell it's there. Two weeks later, the scar is even smaller. You can't see it. If you were the individual, you could feel that it was there, um, but it's certainly not even visible. And um, there's your information going forward. This is the essence of the implant procedure. We load the monitor in this cartridge, slide this implant device under your skin that allows us then to inject the monitor under your skin. We remove the tool, give you a drop of surgical glue that you keep dry for two days, and every beat of your heart for the next three years we have captured. Really allows us to give patient-specific management for atrial fibrillation. In that setting, you get this device that sits by your bed. Any alert, programmable alert or symptom activation, it will automatically remove, retrieve from your device every night while you're sleeping and push it to our database so our office can review it. And we review those things every morning. This is the garage door opener that you can carry to mark symptom activations. And that's a typical report that I receive in my office. What's your heart rate during your normal rhythm? How fast does it go during atrial fibrillation? And when, as the weeks and months go by, are your episodes of atrial fibrillation occurring? So we can know everything about your condition. And we classify atrial fibrillation based on the duration of your episodes. And this helps us guide therapy as to which treatment choices we should make, how aggressive we should be with your case. 
We call that atrial fibrillation paroxysmal if your episodes are seven days or less. So it comes and goes on its own. It's persistent if those episodes are seven days or more. We call it long-standing if atrial fibrillation is present for 12 months or more at a time. And finally, we'll label atrial fibrillation as permanent based on our treatment strategy. So if we've decided that we're going to accept the presence of the, rhythm, of the arrhythmia, we're going to protect you from the consequences, try to minimize your symptoms from the arrhythmia, but we're not going to try to stop it. In that case, we will label that atrial fibrillation as being permanent. So what can be done? We've had a lot of information. We see that there are risks. This can affect your quality of life. We can monitor, capture all this information. What can we actually uh, do about it? So we think of this management triad um, when we're managing patients with atrial fibrillation. First and foremost, stroke prevention. We need to prevent, protect you from the consequences. Then we think about rate control, meaning if you are having atrial fibrillation, we want to make sure that your heart rates are slow enough overall so that it's not any more bothersome to you than it needs to be and also doesn't aggravate your heart, exhaust your heart. And finally, rhythm control. What rhythm are we going to have you in? Are we going to accept atrial fibrillation or are we going to work to get you in normal rhythm? So our, our ability to keep you in normal rhythm when atrial fibrillation comes, convert you back to normal rhythm, preserve normal rhythm is involved in the strategy of rhythm control. So stroke prevention, rate control, rhythm control, that's how we assess your atrial fibrillation and move forward. So let's take each of those in turn. What about stroke prevention? Very simply, anticoagulation with a blood thinning medication is the best and only way to prevent strokes due to atrial fibrillation. And if you are adequately anticoagulated with blood thinning medication, your stroke risk is really similar to the general population. So we can protect you from the consequences of atrial fibrillation, and that's our very first priority. Do you need anticoagulation for atrial fibrillation? And if so, what? We calculate your risk for a stroke due to atrial fibrillation and prescribe your blood thinning medications based on a number of risk factors um, that may be present in you. We ask if you have a history of congestive heart failure, high blood pressure, is your age above 75? Do you have diabetes? Have you had a prior stroke for any reason? Do you have vascular disease? Is your age above 65 but less than 75? And are you female? The maximum score you can receive is a score of nine. Then with your score, we go to this table and advise you on your stroke risk. Here's your score, zero through nine. If your score is nine, you have a 15% risk of stroke per year due to atrial fibrillation. And if your score is five, you have a near 7% risk of stroke per year due to atrial fibrillation. Which blood thinner do we need? If your score is one, aspirin is adequate. If your score is two or higher, a stronger blood thinner is recommended, provided your episode of AFib is greater than 24 hours for a score of two, but even episodes of five minutes in duration for a score of three and higher, we do recommend the stronger blood thinners. Traditionally, that's always been warfarin. We now have a variety of new agents available which are very exciting, very convenient, and those include Xeralto, Eliquis, Cevesa, and Pradaxa. Warfarin, this is what we all trained on, what's been available for the last 50 years. Advantages to warfarin is that it is effective, it does work, it's also inexpensive, and we can use it in a variety of high-risk scenarios like patients who require hemodialysis or have mechanical <coughs> heart valves. Disadvantages to warfarin is that it takes several days to start and get a therapeutic um, blood level. When you're on warfarin, you do have an increased bleed risk. That's always the trade-off. Warfarin requires monitoring to maintain your anticoagulation at a level of two to three, two to three times your blood is two to three times thinner than the average um, population. That's called INR monitoring. And then with warfarin, we have this business of your time and therapeutic range. How much of the time do you actually spend with your INR two to three? Our studies have shown that's about 60% achieved. And when your INR is too low, you don't have adequate stroke protection. And when your INR is too high, your bleeding risk is excessive. 
and we know that your warfarin level is very sensitive to diet or changes in your medications, particularly green leafy vegetables. Patients can't eat spinach or broccoli because their warfarin's changing, so it can be very um, impacting on your quality of life and the choices um, that you can make on a daily basis, which is unfortunate. The new anticoagulations, anticoagulants, and I'll touch on them briefly, have a number of advantages. They're as good as warfarin, sometimes better. You get full protection within hours of your first dose. The bleed risk is less than with warfarin, particularly less brain bleeds or very serious bleeds with the new blood thinners. No monitoring is necessary, so we don't have to do blood checks anymore. There's the possibility of reversal, meaning if you come into the emergency room because you have a serious bleed and you've been on a blood thinner, we can reverse the effect and very soon we'll have an antidote that can totally eliminate the, the risk um, or the anticoagulation effect of the blood thinner when that's you know, necessary, as in you're in a life-threatening condition. And then also those blood thinners can treat from other conditions such as deep vein thrombosis and pulmonary embolism. So they're also treating and protecting against these conditions while they're protecting you from um, your atrial fibrillation. Disadvantages are they tend to be more expensive. For the private insurance now, the copay is zero for some of them, which is very nice. For the Medicare patients, there tends to be a copay that ranges from $20 to $60 a month. Uh, depending on supplemental insurance. That's always something that we have to evaluate individually and we always petition the insurance companies to give us the best price. Trade-off tends to be an increased risk of GI bleeding, not fatal GI bleeding, but GI bleeding that can require a transfusion. So you benefit from less serious brains like brain bleeding, but we have to realize that the trade-off is an increased risk in GI bleeding. And then we have to think that if you miss a dose, you have loss of protection. So we need you to take this every day or twice daily, depending on which one we've selected. Um, but really, this does represent a very exciting evolution that's become available in the last three, four years for the treatment of atrial fibrillation that makes anticoagulation so much more convenient. Patients in my office say routinely, but I heard about Xeralto on the news or there was a commercial and the lawyers are telling us to contact them if they're on Xeralto. I think those commercials are doing a huge disservice to our population in, in um, generating a lot of unnecessary fear in our communities. There is indeed an increased risk of serious bleed on a blood thinner, but that risk is in fact better than with warfarin. And in point of fact, if you weren't on a blood thinner, your risk of stroke could be prohibitively high. So it's always a risk-benefit trade-off, and these do represent a safer and more convenient um, option for anticoagulation and stroke protection than what we've had previously. So let's be cautious with what we allow those um, commercials to influence us. Moving on in our management trial, what about rate control? When you do have your atrial fibrillation, we don't want your heart to go too fast because you'll feel better and it'll be less bothersome. So rate control, what are our options? And many of us are aware of these things. We tend to think of 80 beats per minute or less as ideal rate control, and even less than 110 beats per minute is um, permissible. Start with medical optimization. Let's treat your other conditions, your diabetes, your high blood pressure, your arthritis, make you as healthy as possible so there's less things in your, going on in your body that are antagonizing that rhythm. So we try to remove the stressors. Usually we start then with a beta blocker medication and you'll recognize names like metoprolol, bisoprolol, propranolol, carvedilol. These are beta blockers. They blunt the stress response to your heart. I think of them as a giant lozenger protecting your heart from stress and this tends to alleviate the atrial fibrillation, slow down the rates. Calcium channel blocker is another common class of medications, and you'll know the names diltiazem and um, cardiazem. Um, digoxin, a natural product from the foxglove flower, uh, will also give you about 10 beats per minute control in your atrial fibrillation. And then we have other medications that we reach for as a last resort, um, such as amiodarone, which does have a role in rate control for atrial fibrillation in certain patients. And again, from the implantable monitors, we can assess how much rate control we've achieved for you.
Here's a 65-year-old female with highly symptomatic paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. She has the implantable monitor. Over 92 days during normal rhythm, here are her heart rates, ranging from 60 to 70 to 80 to 90 to 100 beats per minute. This looks, and what percent of the time she spends at each of those heart rates. This looks very normal, very physiologic. So when she's in normal rhythm, her heart rates are very appropriate. During atrial fibrillation, when she has it, you can see that there is a lot of heart racing. She's spending most of her time over 100 beats a minute, even up to 150 and 160 beats a minute. So we have room to improve rate control in this patient. When she's in atrial fibrillation, we would like her to go much slower. So we can work on our rate control strategy um, to improve her. Moving on from rate control, rhythm control. We'd like you not to have atrial fibrillation. We'd like to keep you in normal rhythm, and our efforts to achieve that is what falls under a rhythm control strategy. Antiarrhythmic medications are the first arm of rhythm control. So we have certain classes of medications designed to keep you in normal rhythm, and I've color-coded them kind of by the classes of mechanism that they represent. Names that are familiar to you are flecainide or propafenone or rhythmol. I like to start with these. Why? Because they can be very effective and they're also inexpensive. We can start them on an outpatient basis. So you can just go to your pharmacy, pick it up, and start treatment. These do require you to have essentially a structurally normal heart with no ischemia or evidence of blockages in the arteries to your heart. But if you don't have that, it is very safe and it can be exceedingly effective. Others that we can choose from include Sotolol. This is also effective and inexpensive. You have to have relatively preserved kidney function and we're concerned about some of the electrical intervals on your ECG. You can also start this one in the outpatient setting, but probably within a week we should do an ECG just to make sure that all of your electrical intervals look safe. Ticacin or dofetilide is one of my favorites. It's very effective, it's also costly. You have to come into hospital for three days to start atrial fibrillation because we have to monitor your ECG very closely for any dangerous changes. If those don't occur, it's a great option. My favorite for keeping patients in normal rhythm. It's extremely effective and the side effect profile is outstanding. Rarely does anyone complain to me about being on Ticacin. And finally, like I said, also in a rhythm control strategy, amiodarone and its close cousin, dronetarone, uh, do have a role. They tend to be agents of second choice or last resort for us. Finally, in the rhythm control strategy, once we've used the medical options available to us, what advanced therapy can we offer? And this is what we really specialize in, what we train for years to do and pride ourselves on tremendously, and that's catheter ablation for atrial fibrillation. This is a rhythm control strategy. Ablation is also a symptom control strategy, meaning the more aggressive your symptoms are, the stronger our indication to perform an ablation procedure to alleviate your symptoms heart racing, your palpitations, your fatigue, heart failure that may be attributable to atrial fibrillation, all strong reasons for us to pursue a catheter ablation strategy. Your symptom severity, despite best medical therapy, really determines the urgency of a catheter ablation procedure. And here is a picture from the Tri-City Herald taken almost a year ago showing us at the Cadillac Medical Center beginning an ablation procedure for atrial fibrillation. So we have the patient here. We have a variety of monitor screens that we're using. This is myself. This is one of my technical staff, outstanding, relocated from Spokane to start our electrophysiology program at Cadillac, brings it immediately to a very mature level and allows us to do a number of high volume ablation procedures for atrial fibrillation. I'll say a little bit more about that. So here's what a rhythm control strategy, a successful rhythm control strategy might look like um, on the implantable monitor. Here's a 65-year-old female again, highly symptomatic paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. She has the implantable monitor, and we see here as the months pass, September, October, October, November, November, December, December, hours per day, She's been having atrial fibrillation two hours, 10 hours, 
one hour, three hours. We do the ablation. After the ablation, there's still a few episodes of atrial fibrillation, as is common, but then three months beyond that procedure, complete freedom from atrial fibrillation, and the monitor proves that. She's had none. Any symptom that she may have that she thinks is her atrial fibrillation, we can reassure her that it is not her atrial fibrillation. And while that's the case, we can start to back off on the medications that she's been taking to control her atrial fibrillation, start to demedicalize our patients as the result of a successful ablation procedure. So this is a very exciting um, result when we do see freedom from atrial fibrillation um, due to a catheter ablation. Again, who are the candidates for ablation? And this is the algorithm I'm going through in my mind when I'm talking to an individual patient. If you have sufficiently symptomatic paroxysmal atrial fibrillation and you've tried at least one medication, I have a class one indication or the greenest light to offer you an ablation procedure. If you have symptomatic paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, but I've not yet tried an antiarrhythmic medication, um, you're not a great candidate or you just don't want to do it, still a green light but a weaker indication for ablation. If you have persistent atrial fibrillation and I've tried at least one medication, I have that 2A indication to offer you an ablation procedure. If you have long-standing persistent, greater than 12 months episodes and you've tried an antiarrhythmic medication, still a green light but it's turning yellow um, to offer you the ablation pr um, procedure persistent atrial fibrillation without ever trying an antiarrhythmic medication. Again, still that yellow light indication um, for an ablation procedure. We ablate in all of these contexts and we have success in all of these contexts. I'm still cognizant of the strength of the indication that's provided to us by our professional societies in recommending that procedure to any particular individual. So what happens now if we do decide to offer a patient an ablation procedure for atrial fibrillation. This is kind of the procedure experience. We start with the office consultation where we make the decision. Prior to the procedure, we ask our patient to present to the hospital for a T CT scan or an MRI. We, take, we, we make an image of your atria, the size, shape, anatomic details of your chamber, and we're gonna use that to guide our procedure to get the best result for you in your heart. We'll have you stop your antiarrhythmic medications four to six days before the procedure. Usually stop the blood thinners one to two days prior. You come in on the day of your procedure. We do ablation for atrial fibrillation of general anesthesia. So the first thing that you know is that you go to sleep. The next thing you know is that you wake up and the procedure is over. Nice. In the meantime, three to five hours have passed. We've probably put a transesophageal echo probe down your throat, look for any blood clots in your heart before we start, make sure there is none, that there's nothing that we're gonna knock loose that could give you a stroke. We typically use four catheters. We go through the veins of the groin, up into the heart. Catheters are thin tubes like spaghetti, very electrically sensitive. We position those in the heart and in the top chambers, the atria, we look for the hot spots where the atrial fibrillation could be coming from, and with one of those catheters, we try to cauterize those hot spots. We recognize that most of the atrial fibrillation is coming from your left atria. Our catheters through your veins have gone into the right atria, so we poke across the little thin wall separating those two chambers, thin your blood very thoroughly while we have the catheters in your arterial circulation, and then ablate in that chamber to cauterize regions where the atrial fibrillation is coming from. When we're done, the catheters come out, we reverse the blood thinners, we wake you up, and we expect you to recover overnight and walk out of hospital the next day feeling just fine. Go back on your blood thinner, go back on your antiarrhythmic at least for the first three months, avoid heavy lifting for a couple of days, otherwise there is no restriction. The first three months, we will not consider any recurrence of your atrial fibrillation to be a treatment failure because the procedure is still maturing and the heart is still a little bit irritable from the procedure. It's really three months and beyond that we look for the enduring success of our ablation procedure. Our goal in the long run is, of course, symptom control. We want, first and foremost, for you to feel better. Next, we want to start reducing the number of medications that we're asking you to take to 
control your atrial fibrillation. We'd love to stop the antiarrhythmic medication because you don't need it anymore, start to back off the blood thinners, and, or sorry, the, the um, rate control medications like the beta blockers, and maybe, just maybe, if there's truly no more atrial fibrillation, we can even recommend stopping um, the blood thinning medication. So again, you come in for a CT scan. We take this image of your left atrial chamber. These are the veins that insert into that chamber. We know the size and shape of your chamber we're gonna, where we're gonna be performing the procedure. We get a CT scan like this. We actually decompose that image, take off all the other structures, prune down the vessels to your lungs. We're left with this chamber, and that guides our procedure, which in fact looks like this, in the electrophysiology laboratory. So here is a procedure day in the electrophysiology lab. Um, we have a control room with our staff. We have our patient on the table here, a number <coughs> of monitoring equipments to guide us in what we're doing. And we pride ourselves in doing an outstanding uh, job for each individual. From our standpoint, how much ablation do we do? Here we see the veins inserting into the heart. Our main goal is to electrically isolate those veins that insert into that chamber. We think of them as jet engines of electrical activity that fire sporadically and induce that rhythm um, in your atria and are responsible for your symptoms. So our first goal with our catheter is to walk around those veins. Each dot represents a spot where we've applied ablation with our catheter and we go around both the left veins and the right veins in that chamber, and that is the backbone of every ablation procedure. If you are in a paroxysmal pattern clinically, that's all we're gonna do, pulmonary vein isolation. And we expect, so it's, we do the least work and we expect the best result. If you're in a paroxysmal pattern of atrial fibrillation, we expect an 80 to 90% freedom from atrial fibrillation over the next five years because of our ablation procedure. We did the least work, we get the best, expect the best result. If you're in a persistent pattern of atrial fibrillation, we are going to do more work. In addition to the pulmonary vein isolation, we're gonna be more diligent about looking for hot spots, other places in your chamber that is also contributing and we'll ablate those at the same time. It may require ablation lines connecting the pulmonary vein isolation um, maneuvers, again, to control atrial fibrillation in your heart, which is more predisposed to that arrhythmia. We can promise, expect probably 70% freedom from atrial fibrillation due to the ablation procedure in the setting of a persistent or long-standing persistent um, patient. Procedural risks. We can't make them zero. We're very careful. There's a risk of stroke. Catheters in the arterial circulation can have blood clots form on them that cause stroke. We are very meticulous about anticoagulation during our procedure. And the other thing I honestly worry about is a catheter poking through the wall of your heart. We'd have to stop the procedure, drain the blood from around the heart, um, basically stop your procedure. That'd be unfortunate. So we are exceedingly careful. The catheter technology that prevents that complication has had a tremendous advancement within the last six months. We now know how much force that catheter is pushing on the wall of your heart. We have that real-time feedback at every instant, and we know what levels of contact are safe. Six months ago, we didn't have that. Now we have that and we use it in every case, and the safety advantage that represents is tremendous. Also, the efficacy advantage. We know we have to push at least so hard to apply an effective ablation lesion, but don't push too hard that you might poke through the wall. We have that information now, and um, what that means for our ablation program is um, very exciting. In fact, here at Cadillac, we've gone beyond the traditional ablation approach, adding our own levels of sophistication to get even better results in our patients. And that is before we do the ablation, um, before we actually perform the ablation, we have catheters in your heart. We're gonna look for the hot spots in your heart that are really contributing. And then when we ablate around those veins, as I've described, we're gonna be sure to incorporate those important spots in that standard ablation protocol um, to get you the best result. Why go right beside a very important region when you could go right through an important region? And if you take the time in advance to identify those spots, you can perform a standard ablation procedure much more effectively. And that's the backbone of our program in Cadillac and something we've been recognized for 
at a national level and published on, and our approach at Cadillac is guiding ablation procedures. Other operators around the country are using our methodologies to improve their approach to um, their ablation procedures. So it's been fun and exciting for us to be on the forefront of ablation procedures for atrial fibrillation and to have had our approach um, be recognized at a national level and to know that that's helping other centers um, improve their techniques as well. There is another option for ablation. So far I've always talked about cautery, going around the heart with a single catheter. There is another technology that is available for ablating atrial fibrillation. It's called the cryo balloon. Here you see this operator with this balloon. In the heart, he will park that balloon against each pulmonary vein and using freezing rather than heating, electrically isolate that vein. And this is a technology that's been around. There's some important advancements that we're anticipating coming up with this ablation technology. And um, I'm expecting to see even better results with this approach um, in the months and years to come. That's ablation for atrial fibrillation. Let's talk about a few conditions that can, that we often see in our atrial fibrillation patients and how we can solve their, um, these issues as well. First is the tacky Brady syndrome, as we call, the fast slow syndrome. We know that patients with atrial fibrillation often have inappropriately slow heart rates when they're in normal rhythm. Interesting. And often these patients do require um, pacemaker technology to treat that condition. Our sponsor today is Biotronic. I, Biotronic makes my favorite pacemaker for Tacky Brady syndrome. Here is a patient with a pacemaker. This is a device that sits under the skin over your chest. You have two leads into your heart. One is in your top chamber and one is in your bottom chamber. This pacemaker can sense how forcefully your heart is beating and based on how forcefully your heart is beating determine what heart rate you actually want to match that level of what we call contractility. So when you're stressed or excited or you're exercising, your heart beats more forcefully and this pacer matches the heart rate that you would like to have for that level of activity that your heart is trying to achieve. Very exciting. So here we see a 90-year-old gentleman with atrial fibrillation with the Tacky Brady syndrome. He had a heart monitor. He spends the majority of his time, 85% of his time, less than 60 beats a minute. When he's in normal rhythm, that's profoundly slow. During atrial fibrillation, his heart does tend to race a little bit more, uh, still not going too fast. We can help him, not necessarily by improving his atrial fibrillation, but by improving his heart rates when he is in normal rhythm. So he received one of our pacemakers, and now rather than spending 85% of his time less than 60 beats a minute, he could spend 90% of his time above 60 minutes and achieve some normal physiologic heart rates. And he feels tremendously better as a result. That pacemaker also provides monitoring function, just like the implantable monitors, and lets us know everything about his atrial fibrillation so we can continue to treat him for atrial fibrillation. There's evidence that when you use a pacemaker with this very physiologic mechanism, in fact, your atrial fibrillation improves because your heart does like those normal physiologic heart rates um, while your rhythm is normal. So your atrial fibrillation can improve, your, your level of monitoring is, is available to us, and um, we can address your slow heart rate in a way that's most beneficial to you. There's another pacemaker that can actually try to get you out of atrial fibrillation, be part of a rhythm control strategy. Here's a pacemaker that can detect um, when your heart is in atrial fibrillation, and very much like a defibrillator, try to burst pace into that fast rhythm and try to interrupt it. It has success in certain people. In my experience, not overwhelming success, but in certain individuals, there is the possibility for quite reliable termination of atrial flutter or atrial um, fibrillation episodes in individuals. That device watches your atria for when the activity tends to organize and then sensing that it'll burst in a little bit faster than what that or the rate of that organized activity. And if it is unsuccessful, it will reevaluate your rhythm and see if that organized activity has changed in its rate and again recalculate a, a, a burst rate and at the appropriate time try to re-deliver that bursting therapy it may pop you out of your arrhythmia. Again, I haven't seen an overwhelming success uh, 
of this, but in certain individuals there is modest success and it's an interesting tool in our armamentarium uh, for treating atrial fibrillation. Some patients with atrial fibrillation also have heart failure and for other reasons require protection with an implantable defibrillator. A defibrillator is a device that can shock your heart if your bottom chambers are experiencing a life-threatening fast rhythm. Here's a biotronic um, defibrillator implanted in the chest. Uh, we see the single lead in the heart is um, a little bit thicker. That's the shock coil. That's the defibrillator system to protect this patient. We'd also like to know about their atrial fibrillation. So on that single lead for the defibrillator, here we have sensing vectors that can tell us everything that's going on in the top chamber, allow us to monitor atrial fibrillation, have that information so we can also treat this patient who needs a defibrillator for atrial fibrillation and get the best result for that individual because of the monitoring function that's available um, from this particular device. So another very exciting tool for us to use in the management of our atrial fibrillation patients. Let's look at a few clinical cases, some examples, and see this therapy in action. Here's a 64-year-old male. He has coronary disease, he's had a stent, and he has atrial fibrillation. He can't tell when he's having atrial fibrillation at all, but he does feel a very profound and debilitating fatigue over his life recently, over the last um, months to a, to a year. We gave him an implantable monitor so we could understand what was taking place and treated him with Ticacin. In the presence of Ticacin, the monitor tells us his AFib was down to about 35%. He's already feeling better. We can see that his heart rates when he's in normal rhythm now are um, pretty normal. During atrial fibrillation, his heart rates are a little bit faster, so there's some room for some rate control as well as some room for rhythm control. The monitor tells us when his episodes tend to start. Most of them started at nine o'clock at night. 40% of the time he'd go into atrial fibrillation at nine o'clock at night. And his wife says, that's exactly when I lose him. He starts to fade, he goes a little bit dark, he's more fatigued about nine o'clock at night, quite reliably. And we can tell her with the monitoring result that's because of your atrial fibrillation. We've just proved that that's the cause of your symptoms, um, that atrial fibrillation is responsible for the symptoms that you're experiencing. And we know that the, we trust the monitored data because it's recording the heartbeats so effectively. It's such a high quality signal. We brought this gentleman to our ablation lab. This is the map of the heart from his ablation. You can see we've gone around the pulmonary veins as we've described. And we've also ablated these other hot spots that we've identified throughout his chamber that are contributing. During his ablation, his atrial fibrillation stopped. That's always nice. And then when it stopped, there was nothing we could do in our procedure to restart his atrial fibrillation. That heart would not fibrillate for anything. You know, we give adrenaline through the IV, we do aggressive burst pacing protocols, try to get the arrhythmia started. His heart just wouldn't support it. At follow-up, he has 0% AFib. So here's 24 hours a day for the months leading up to his ablation. And you can see a high burden of atrial fibrillation. The ablation is performed and going forward for months and now over a year afterwards, he hasn't had any. So a remarkable result. We know he's still alive because here's his average heart rate with him in normal rhythm now. So an outstanding result that we've been able to achieve for this individual and know, prove that we've been successful for him. We can tell him any symptom you're feeling is not due to your AFib because we know your heart is not having fibrillation. And then we can start to remove the medications. He's now off the Ticacin, the beta blockers are lower in dose. He's feeling great, doing very well on minimal um, medical therapy. So we have some remarkable examples for success, and we continue to work with each patient to get the best result for them at each point in time. My patients ask, and I like to advise, what else can I do? What can I do to help my atrial fibrillation? So we can talk about the importance of lifestyle. And this is also a very interesting area. We have a recent research study called the ARREST-AF trial. It's from a 
um, research group in Australia, and hence I put the, the picture of the kangaroo, um, showing that aggressive risk factor modification, meaning improve your lifestyle, get rid of those stressors on your heart, <coughs> does improve the long-term success of your ablation procedure. That was the finding of their study. So here we have risk factor modification, including improvements in high blood pressure, diabetes, obesity, excessive alcohol, and sleep apnea, lowering weight, controlling blood pressure, controlling diabetes, reducing your cholesterol levels, has a beneficial effect on atrial fibrillation. You know, here's the understanding. We have all these medical conditions that's affecting your atria, causing them to have to fibrillate so you have atrial fibrillation. We can take you for an ablation procedure for atrial fibrillation. But then after that ablation procedure, if you still have all this present, that heart is still going to suffer and you're still predisposed to more atrial fibrillation. So if you get it again, maybe your substrate is even worse because of that ongoing disease. And that will affect the success of that ablation procedure. But what if, before the ablation procedure, we start to modify these risk factors, really improve your health, so that we can reduce the incidence of, of atrial fibrillation before your procedure, probably delay your procedure, and then after your procedure, continue that risk factor modification. Continue that aggressive medical therapy. If we do that, your atria tend to be less diseased post-ablation, such that the outcome of your ablation procedure is significantly better. Do you see how that works? Their study showed decreased atrial fibrillation frequency, duration, and symptom severity, a five-fold greater success from the ablation procedure overall if the patients are engaged and doing as much as they can to optimize these other areas of their health. So we're working with individuals even more closely based on these results to really revisit their entire healthcare regime, lifestyle choices um, for the goal of improving their atrial fibrillation. So what the advice I can give to people is address your comorbid conditions and we need your help to do this. Address your high blood pressure, control your diabetes, address sleep apnea, address asthma COPD, maintain a healthy weight, maintain healthy gums and teeth. That's an important source of inflammation that can aggravate your atrial fibrillation in your heart. Reduce joint disease, inflammatory conditions in your joints, and preserve your psychological stress, all with the goal of improving your atrial fibrillation. Positive lifestyle choices. Try for a plant-based, whole foods diet and these are described in the literature, a DASH diet, a Mediterranean diet, but really, not saying you can never eat meat, but make your diet plant-based and go for whole foods rather than processed foods. Exercise 30 to 60 minutes a day, if possible, five days per week. Brisk walking, if you can. Core strength training to imp improve the musculature in your core, you know, in your trunk and in your legs and in your, in your hips. Get enough sleep drink plenty of water, and use filtered water to remove heavy metals. You know, not just tap water, avoid carbonated beverages because they can deplete the electrolytes in your body, predispose your heart to um, fibrillation. Get some sunlight. We're all worried about melanoma, but 20, 10 to 20 minutes on your limbs exposed per day in the summer is just fine. Um, avoid smoking. Caffeine is not helping you. Minimize or abstain from alcohol. Alcohol tends to deplete magnesium, which provides a lot of electrical stability for your heart. So if you are going to drink alcohol, I strongly suggest that you also supplement on, on magnesium. There's a small case to be made maybe for red wine containing um, resveratrol, which can be a heart-healthy supplement, um, even then in, um, in strict moderation, please. Nutritional supplements, I'm recommending to a lot of my patients now, is ample, supplementation with magnesium. The side effect is diarrhea. If you have that, then take less until you don't have it anymore. Um, fish oil, the perfect energy substrate for your heart. Give your heart the fuel that it wants to beat. It'll relieve the stress um, from your heart. Coenzyme Q10 in doses of 200, even 400 milligrams a day. 
I'm recommending to patients. I myself am taking 100 milligrams a day. I don't have atrial fibrillation, but I don't want to get it. And then a high quality multivitamin. This really helps the muscles of your heart and throughout your body metabolize and produce energy. There's evidence that as we age, molecules in your heart, in your muscles like coenzyme Q10 do tend to decline. So there is a role for replacement. And um, I've had patients cancel their ablation procedures for atrial fibrillation because they had such a great response to coenzyme Q10. We don't see it in everybody, but there are those examples and those are things that you can do um, to improve your chances of success. Core training, do it at home if you like. You can buy videos, Pilates for beginners, bar method for beginners. Improve the strength of your core. It'll make you healthier. Use that to supplement your walking program. You don't have to join a gym. You don't have to have weights. Things you can do to improve your overall health with the goal of improving your atrial fibrillation. Uh, some books that I've really um, enjoyed. Keeping Your Heart in Rhythm. A lot of the lifestyle recommendations I've already talked about um, coming out of these books. The importance of recognizing toxicities that may be present in our water, in the air we breathe, that can aggravate atrial fibrillation strategies for minimizing those. Use filtered water, for example. Um, some of the energy discussion in the heart with the CoQ10, um, really well described by Dr. Sinatra. And overall health maintenance, The Younger You, by my, I, my friend and colleague from New York, uh, Dr. Braverman. Helping you identify what's the weakest link in your body and what can you do to address that with the goal of preemptively treating your system that's most likely to fail or cause you problems later in life. You know, you may have the heart of a 50-year-old, the brain of a 40-year-old, the liver, level, liver of a 60-year-old, but if you've got the bones of an 85-year-old, you know, guess what's gonna take you first and what's gonna be your first major problem moving forward? Probably your bones. So if you can identify that up front, why not address it? Improve your overall health, minimize your chance of having atrial fibrillation. He walks you through that um, self-evaluation um, process very nicely. We would love to help you, love to help you, either myself, my nurse practitioner, one of our cardiology colleagues. Feel free to call our office. We're at the Gothels Building uh, in Richland. That's the Cadillac Clinic, right across from the Cadillac Regional Medical Center, the hospital where we perform our procedures, where we do our admissions for TECAS and loading, for example. I almost always have at least somebody in hospital for TECAS and loading, two people right now. Um, so we're treating a large volume. And, and getting some very exciting results. I have my personal website, heartdrjim.com. A lot of the information that we've discussed is on there. A Facebook page where I post, I also Heart Dr. Jim Facebook page. I post a lot of articles related to atrial fibrillation, health maintenance. Um, I find it very exciting. You're welcome to follow along, see some of the latest research developments for atrial fibrillation as they become available. And finally, this presentation will be on my YouTube channel. So you can watch it from your computer at home at your leisure. And that's something I'll be encouraging my patients to do who couldn't be here today, is to say, review these ideas. Think through the treatment options we're recommending to you, what else we can do. Think about the ways you can improve your lifestyle. Watch the video until you feel satisfied in your understanding of atrial fibrillation. So on the web, you go to YouTube, do a search on YouTube for Heart Dr. Jim. You'll see this icon. Click on that icon. You'll get a list of my videos, and this will be one of them. And I encourage you to spend more time with the material. It's a lot of information to take all at once. Um, so it is worth your review. Thank you to our sponsors, particularly Biotronic, also Biosense Webster, for hosting our meeting this morning. Um, tremendous amount of work and also resources to make an event like this possible and I think we're all truly grateful.